Ooh, uh, uh, no, no, Master Wong. Okay, <laughs> this is dumb. The art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there, everybody. Mike Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis. And today we're going to be reacting to the OG of YouTube martial arts, Master Wong. Of course, if you're new to the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button, click the thumbs up button, click the little bell so you can get notified anytime I release a new video. And if you live too far from Indianapolis to train with me in person, we now have online training through our website, Kempo360.com. On Kempo360.com, you're going to learn the 18 essential techniques for survival. It is what I teach to all of my beginners. It covers stand, clinch, and ground defense. It's one of the most well-rounded beginner programs I've ever seen. Once again, that's on Kempo360. Dot com. So let's go ahead and get back to the video. So Master Wong is really like one of the most old school YouTubers uh, when it comes to martial arts. I mean, I think everybody who's into martial arts has seen his videos for years. Um, he is a self proclaimed Wing Chun expert, Jeet Kune Do expert, and Tai Chi expert. Of those three arts, I am a certified instructor in two of them. I'm both a full instructor in Jeet Kune Do, as well as I'm a senior instructor in Wing Chun. So I think I can kind of look at his videos and get a sense for you know, what he's doing. Now, as far as what lineage of Jeet Kune Do, what lineage of Wing Chun he does, you know, he's really kind of tight-lipped about that. Um, and looking at his Jeet Kune Do and looking at his Wing Chun, um, if it is legit, it definitely comes from a different lineage than mine because he does both his Wing Chun and his Jeet Kune Do very differently than I was taught. Um, he is the master showman. He's also, also very popular uh, because of that, uh, as you'll see through this video. Um, unfortunately, for copyright purposes, I'm not going to be able to include his audio, uh, but I'll be yapping a lot, so you won't be needing it. So what are we looking at today? We are looking at the five self-defense moves everyone should know by Master Wong. So I'm going to be skipping around on the video a little bit here. Um, so let's see here. So we have a cut block into an eye jab. All right, that's pretty great. So the guy throws a punch, boom and he's cut blocking into the eye jab. So what is a cut block? Well, a cut block, let me get rid of that ad. A cut block is when instead of parrying a strike or guarding against a strike, you actually strike in a way that knocks their weapon out of the way. And so this is actually right from Wing Chun um, as well as Jeet Kune Do. Once again, he has that Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do background. Um, by keeping his elbow tight, it creates this little off ramp that knocks his opponent's punch offline. And then he's choosing to use the Bu Ji or the Bu Sao from Wing Chun, which basically just means darting fingers. And this goes directly to the eye. Out of all strikes in martial arts, the eye jab is king. Um, one thing to remember is that when you are defending yourself or when you're fighting in general, um, how hard you hit is determined by your mass and how fast you throw the shot. So a heavier person is always going to be able to throw a harder punch than a smaller person uh, if, if all other things are equal. So that's why there's weight classes in boxing and in kickboxing and MMA. However, the one strike that this doesn't apply to is what Master Wong's doing here, which is the eye jab, the Bu Sao from Wing Chun. The eye jab, it, because it's hitting such a vulnerable target, I mean, the eyeball of a, of a five-year-old and the eyeball of Brock Lesnar are equally weak. And um, nothing, you cannot say that about any other part of that comparison. And so if you, not that you should go around poking five-year-olds in the eye, but it would have an equal impact on both Brock Lesnar and a five-year-old. So he's using this cut block, which we consider offensive defense. That's a core principle, both in Jeet Kune Do as well as Kempo 360. Um, that instead of just blocking and attacking, he's making his defense offense. So instead of blocking and attacking, he's blocking with his forearm while simultaneously slipping in that eye jab and striking him in the eye. This is a little bit of a high level 
self-defense technique, but good martial arts takes time to get good at. One of the biggest things to remember is that self-defense, regardless of what people advertise to you, is not something you can learn in three easy lessons. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, keep the ball rolling. This first technique, uh, I like it a lot. I give it, if I had to give it a score, I'd give it like a, a nine out of 10. The only reason why it's not 10 out of 10 is it's awfully high level. So, um, you know, you're gonna need to do a lot of training to be able to hit this in real life. So next defense, a shield block and a shot to the body. Okay. So the shield block is one of my favorite blocks. It's the first block I actually teach all of my students in Kempo 360 um, because it, it basically is like putting on a helmet, right? So if you study um, karate or, you know, taekwondo, when you're first learning, they, they give you these, or even amateur boxing, they give you helmets to put on to protect your head. And of course, in self-defense, you don't have those helmets. But if you look at the meat of my arm, how big this is, the helmet that you would wear for like a karate tournament or a boxing tournament is only about that thick, right? If you look at the meat of my arm, it's much thicker. So if I am going to absorb a blow, it's I put this helmet on that we call the shield block. So why is it we don't do the 360 block where we block out like this, like they'll do in Krav Maga? Well, this is meeting force with force. I'm taking my bone and I'm absorbing the blow on my bone. Some people do this in a deflecting manner, which is a little bit better, but Ultimately, this becomes whoever's bones are most dense wins, whereas this is just meat. So it absorbs in kind of the same way that like a cushion would. Um, and then because he's moving in, uh, most of the blow is actually deflected behind him. See how he moved in as he hit. So he didn't just stand there and eat it. He kind of moved towards the punch. And so that actually means that the punch actually lands kind of behind his head and he's really only kind of being hit with a forearm. Now, the way he's holding his shield block though is a problem because he's holding it like this, which is kind of the classic boxing way of doing it. See, when you're, when you're studying boxing, your glove is huge. So you can get away with just kind of covering the side of your head because your glove is massive. But as you can see, without a glove, my hand doesn't offer me sufficient protection. And so in an actual self-defense situation, you'd want to modify that to have a, a higher block. So your forearm will protect your temple and your bicep will protect your jawline. See you like that. So this is what we this is what we want to see. And then it looks like he's maybe going for a punch to the sternum. Okay, and then he's coming in with a hammer fist. Okay, that's actually really uh yeah, so he's going sternum. Okay, and now he is using the tonsil. We'll get to that in a second. So the, he's going for this punch to the sternum. A strike to, a stir, to the sternum is a very powerful shot. It hurts like a son of a gun if it's done correctly, but it's not a very weak part of the body. So it's mostly a shocking technique. It's not bad, it's just not the best. So you think about, about you have like good, better, best, it's kind of like in the good category. I would still do it. We actually teach this in pushing the circle in Kempo 360, but we teach it that you're striking with your elbow, which is a much more powerful tool than a fist. I would recommend going back to that first technique that if I'm gonna do that shield block, instead of hitting to the sternum, hit to the eye jab instead. Um, and then from there, he swings down into what we call the angle one hammer fist. And this is a great move. Um, if you had to break something, like you had to break a board or something, this would be the first technique I would teach someone to do because the padding of your hand is such that you can really deliver a lot of blow with very little risk to your hands. One of the mistakes a lot of people make when it comes to fighting is they think that just by closing your fist and throwing it at someone's face, you'll be fine. But the truth is you have to condition your knuckles to be able to take the impact of a punch. And so you actually should rely more on open-handed strikes to defend yourself than close-handed strikes. The hammer fist, on the other hand, if you hit up here, you'll break your finger. But if you hit about here, that's actually a very sturdy part of the hand and can be uh, used just like you're swinging a hammer. Uh, very powerful tool. So as far as this self-defense technique is concerned, uh, I'm gonna get, I'm actually gonna give it a little bit lower um, than I did his Biu Sao or his Biu Ji. I'm gonna to say it's probably like a seven out of 10. Um, the initial response of a shield block is good, but he's using that kind of more boxer shield, which is not the best. He should use a deeper shield. And then he should focus on going directly for the kill as opposed to hitting the sternum and then doing this devastating shot. So let's go ahead and move on to his next uh, technique here. 
All right, so he looks like, oh, okay, there we go. There's that spear elbow that I was talking about. Then maybe Shudo and a chop. Okay, that's pretty sick. If you remember how I was talking about how the shield block creates this like, you know, head cage. Well, you can see he's using the shield block on one side and then he's using his other elbow to create what we call an elbow spear to the sternum. And this is an awesome entry. Um, anybody who studies a grappling art, like wrestling, judo, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu needs to learn this entry that you cover up and smash that tip of your elbow into the person's sternum because from there the whole thing can unwind into a tie clinch or under hooks basically the entire world of grappling is at your fingertips once that elbow smashes into their sternum and because they're moving forward with this big hit it allows you to really get in tight very very quickly which is why this is a smart move um, because most of the impact of a punch happens at the end of the punch right? It's when I'm done hitting. So the closer you are, oddly enough, the safer you are. So when it comes to self-defense, kind of give yourself this rule. You're all the way out where they can't touch you, or you're all the way in where the punches aren't very powerful. By coming in with this deep shield and then the elbow spear, he's keeping his head safe. Like I said, I would like his shield block to be a little tighter, but he's keeping his head safe. And then that elbow spear is allowing him to immediately make contact. And then Wing Chun, we call that building the bridge. And then once you have that contact, you can maintain it so that you can control your opponent. Now, from here, he goes into um, like a shooto to the throat, and then he unwinds with a chop to the throat. So, the shooto is a move that we do in Kenpo and Wing Chun, they call it Fox Sao, which is like whisking hand. Um, and so, he comes in and then immediately unwinds with this shooto motion. Honestly, from this range, if you look here, that unfolding of the shudo would have very little impact as far as a hit is concerned. It would hurt, but it would probably do no damage. And that is an important distinction to make that between something that does pay, causes pain and something that causes damage. Like for example, I did an episode on pressure points. If you squeeze right here, that hurts, but it doesn't do any damage. It does no harm. Um, we want a technique. We want our techniques to do damage to our opponent so that uh, we incapacitate them. So that shudo is not necessarily gonna be the best tool for that. But what that shudo can be used for, or that fox owl, because he's a Wing Chun man, they can be used to create space to open you up for one of your hits. Now, I personally would disagree with creating space here. I feel like you've already bridged that gap. You've already sought the bridge, as we would say in Wing Chun. And to me, you should maintain that connection so you can minimize the amount of damage. And then from here, he goes in with that downwards chop. This is a really cool move that's kind of lost favor because of striking with gloves on, but a, a, a nice, if especially if he's hitting, hitting the clavicle, a downwards chop where you're hitting with your ulna bone to the collarbone can be a devastating blow. Because if you can break or dislocate this bone, you effectively take their entire arm out of the equation. It's an extremely potent shot if done correctly. Why is it that we don't really see it that much anymore? Because it doesn't show up that cleanly in martial sport where we've already agreed to fight each other. There's a lot of self-defense situations or self-defense techniques that are very specialized for being in a position that would not show up in an MMA fight against a well-trained fighter because a well-trained fighter is going to know how to avoid those positions and not put themselves in a stupid spot. But what I do like about this downwards chop, even if he doesn't break that clavicle, you see how he's effectively halfway to getting that tie clinch. So he could grab the back of the guy's head here and then deliver an elbow on the other side is how we would handle it in Kempo 360. As far as self-defense techniques is concerned, um, I'm going to give this, I'm going to take that one right back up to that nine, um, nine out of 10. I like it. I actually like it. The elbow spear is super potent. He needs to clean up his head shield. And if you're talking about, I'm going to spear, shooto and chop, Mm, I don't like that. That's going to be like a five out of 10 because I think in that range, neither one of those shots are that great. But if we're using the shooto as a means to create a little space and then we're using chopping motion to make that connection to whip them into something like an elbow, that would then go up to a nine or even a 10 out of 10 technique. So it just depends on how you're going to use those tools, which is a very interesting aspect 
of martial arts in general is that one motion can be several things. A lot of times when we look at something like Kung Fu, we'll see someone do a motion like this, right? And we'll say, you know, like, oh, like, you know, this, no one fights like that. Um, but if you actually study with these guys, they have a thousand ways to use this. It's not that like, oh, here's the one way that motion is used, that this could be a strike followed by a strike. This could be a block followed by a grab. This could be someone's hands are already on you and you're removing the hand from you and grabbing. There's a lot of different ways you could use one motion. And so here that spear is very clear, but then that shooto and chop could be me hitting and hitting. It could be me hitting and grabbing. It could be me making space and hitting. There's there's a lot of different ways you could use it. Um, and that's always uh, kind of a good sign of uh, good Kung Fu. Uh, one of the guys who I worked out with last year and the year before that was Master Daniel Casino, the original Scorpion from uh, the Mortal Kombat video games. And he always will say that if you have one application for Kung Fu, uh, your Kung Fu is no good. If you have a hundred, your Kung Fu is okay. And if you have a thousand applications, now your Kung Fu is good. And so his whole idea is, any tool you have from your martial arts, you should have thousands of ways to use it. That was kind of a tangent, but you know, maybe it might be usable. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go on uh, and see what his next move here is. Ooh, uh, uh, no, no, Master Wong. Okay, <laughs> this is dumb. All right, so this is a downwards parry um, in Wing Chun. We call this Kan Sao, or some people have like a G to it, like Kan Sao. Um, but it's a downwards parry that is as archaic as a musket. We see this in karate. We see this in really traditional systems of Kenpo, and we see this in Kung Fu. We see it in most traditional martial arts, this downwards parry. We should never abandon our head to protect our lower extremities. I hate this. And yes, this is part of Jeet Kune Do. It's in every art that I've studied and it's dumb. In boxing, I learned a very important lesson. Everything you are is contained within this six or seven inch space between your ears. This is where you are located. If you break your ribs, you're still you. You break your knee, you're still you. But if you break your brain, you become something very different than who you are now. So I never want to abandon the protection of my head to protect some other part of me. Now, the Wing Chun man will tell you, once again, I'm a senior instructor in Wing Chun, so I, I, I'm a part of this team. But the Wing Chun man will tell you, oh, no, but once I drop this hand, I can block with this hand. So, see, I'm still protected. But isn't two defenses better than one defense? So how should we actually answer a kick? Well, first, if it's just a straight kick, you wanna get offline. Take a left, take a step to the left to the right, it won't hit you. But as a general rule, we wanna defend lower shots, either with our knees or with our elbows. And even Wing Chun has answers to this. They have the Jum Sao, which uses the, the elbow to block, as well as they have a, a lovely little suite of technique, of uh, kicking techniques. They have a lovely suite of kicking techniques, very specifically designed to uh, defend against kicks. This move is in every martial art, this downwards block, and it needs to disappear. No professional fighter really uses this move, that you defend your ribs with your elbows, you defend everything below the waist with your knees. This downwards parry is no good. Don't recommend it. Please stop doing it. So let's go ahead, continue to see what he does after that downwards parry. Comes in, stomping kick to the back of the knee, shooting to smash it completely to the ground. This is a great example of kind of a lost technique within martial sport, the stomping side kick. So most of the time, if we're using a side kick in martial sport, it's more of a flicky side kick or a pushing side kick because a trained fighter never really puts themselves in a position where the stomping side kick can be used. Furthermore, most martial sports make a move that involves you stomping down on top of your opponent illegal. Uh, and rightfully so. We don't need athletes getting hurt. But what he's doing is he is stomping his foot straight to the ground through his opponent's knee. So this is not just going to hurt it, it's going to break it. Once again, the goal is to incapacitate, incapacitate your opponent. But as far as this technique, uh, oh, wait, 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 he's got more. Oh, he's just he's just like attacking the guy in the back. Oh, the guy's sitting there. So that's, <laughs> all right, that's, that's what we call mannequin training. Uh, we wanna avoid mannequin training. What, what do I mean by mannequin training? Well, mannequin training is where you do a move, 
and then your partner just kind of freezes while you do like 17 other moves. In reality, uh, you know, you do this to the person and they uh, either uh, fall to the ground or they get up and run or they turn to attack you. They do a lot more than just kind of sit there in a frozen position while you do eight moves. And a lot of times, and Kempo people are really guilty of this, um, they'll say like, well, in real life, I'd be doing all the moves faster. Well, in real life, he wouldn't be standing perfectly still no matter how fast you were going. So um, we always want our uke, the guy we're doing the technique to, we always want them to behave as realistically as possible. And, eat, and so if we're going in slow motion, they should be receiving the blows in slow motion, not just pausing. But regardless of that, how do I think about this technique? What do I think of this technique? It is a one out of 10. A, a low parry, like I said, you gotta get rid of that. It's gone. No more of those. All right, let's keep on going. Oh shit! Single lapel grab. Those of you who are not familiar with Kempo won't understand how excited I am, but Kempo is an expert at defending the single lapel grab. Jaw jokes aside, uh, in uh, the art of Kempo, uh, this is a really common reference point that we use for self-defense. It is It can represent almost anything. So you imagine they're grabbing onto your lapel and they're talking to you. They grab you to pull you into a hit. They're reaching out and choking you. They're grabbing by the back of your neck. Maybe their hand is on your shoulder aggressively. All of those are touches that we need to respond to. As a general rule, there's two ways to respond to uh, someone putting their hand on you. There is a soft and a hard response. The soft response is going to be to remove it somehow. So I, I, I step back and I knock it off of me um, and that kind of gives them a second chance. The hard response is I seize the weapon. I take what they give me. Because the cool thing here is that if he's holding you with this weapon, he's not using that weapon to hit you. So I wanna secure it to my body so it doesn't go anywhere, if that makes sense. Now I know exactly what tool he's gonna to use. If he's gonna hit me, it's gonna be with the other hand. So I'm extra prepared to defend myself. And because my hand's on top of his hand, I can strike with both hands, but he can't strike with the one I have pinned, which is pretty slick. So let's see if he seizes the weapon or if he removes the weapon, is he being nice? Or is he being mean? It's Master Wong. He's got to be mean, right? Seizes it. Yeah, boy. <laughs> there you go, Master Wong. All right. So, yeah, he immediately holds on to the weapon, keeps it tight to his body so that it doesn't move. And then once again, comes in with a shield block. So, yeah, a lot of his Jeet Kundo training is actually coming out here. Um, that that's a very common thing we'll see in a more modern Jeet Kundo system. Uh, Bruce Lee, the creator of Jeet Kundo, didn't do a lot of shield blocks, but the Jeet Kune Do community uh, at this point does a ton of them. Uh, so he's seizing the weapon. In Wing Chun, uh, this is what we call the bridge. The second Wing Chun form is called Chum Q, which literally means seeking the bridge. This is the bridge. This is what we're seeking in Wing Chun. We, once we make contact, we wanna keep that contact. And then he's moving in with a shield to defend against the punch. Where does he go from here? Goes for his chop. Always try and go for a finger break or a thumb break, maybe a wrist lock. So he gets in tight, chop, maybe breaks the thumb. Oh, and then he's gonna break the elbow. You know, this is actually looking a little bit like old school Kenpo, to be honest. All of this is possible, um, uh, but would be really high level. <laughs> so so like, like moving in, getting this hit, breaking his thumb, then breaking his elbow, all of that would be extremely high level self-defense, uh, not very easy to do. Um, but, you know, it's plausible. Um, so like, I would teach this to like someone who is like a, I would teach something like this to someone who's like a brown belt or getting close to being a black belt because maybe they would understand the fight enough to know where to use this. For a beginner, this sequence I would never use. I like the claim and shield, but then I'd go right for eye gouges and elbows. Keep it simple for the beginners. And ultimately, the simple shit is the stuff that works best uh, for self-defense. <laughs> He's such a showman. Look at that face. I wish. I wish I had his charisma. <laughs> 
All right, so let's go ahead and look at his final technique, which is a defense against a rear bear hug. Another really classic self-defense scenario. Rear bear hugs in and of themselves don't feel very dangerous, but they kind of are because a rear bear hug prevents you from using your arms. And if the person just holds you, it's not dangerous. They're just holding you. It's a hug that you don't want. But the problem with the rear bear hug is another opponent could come in and hit you and there's not a lot you could do to defend yourself. This is also a really classic position for someone to pick you up and slam you to the ground. And if you're on the ground and they're standing, well, um, as Master Wong would say, you've got big problems. So, <laughs> so let's go ahead and see how he handles it. So he bases, goes for a headbutt, foot stomp while breaking the grip. And then turns around, sidekick slash back kick to, def to defend himself. Okay. Um, mm, this one's not that great. So I see this a lot that like when someone grabs you, we're like going to just like hit them with, with a headbutt to the back of the head. Um, this is far more specific than you might think uh, hitting that headbutt because this kind of assumes that you know the person where the person's head is located behind you. Some people's head may be here. Some people's head may be here. Some, if it's directly behind you, you may be able to get that headbutt, but anywhere else, probably not, right? So uh, what I would want to see instead is him immediately just focusing on attacking the grip itself. So the first thing he does is he lowers himself, which is great because if someone's going to try to pick you up, they've already oriented themselves in a way to pick you up. So by you suddenly changing your orientation, it fucks with their orientation and takes all of your weight and puts it on the small of their back. And as we know, we don't want to lift with the small of our back, so we're making it harder for them to lift us. But him going straight for the head, but ah, it may or may not hit, but you want to immediately uh, cover the grip. Because usually what I'll do here is I'll try to um, either expand out, make myself much larger so that's harder for them to grab or drive that grip of theirs down so that they are no longer holding me in a place of power. You think about like if you were to open up a can of peanut butter or something, you'd hold it close to your chest. So if I can change where their arms are located in uh, relation to their body, I change their position of power. Um, his idea here seems to be you're gonna hit the headbutt, maybe break a finger and then stomp on the foot to escape. Ah, it's like I said, the headbutt's probably not going to happen. The finger break can happen, but only once you've created a solid base and you've changed the orientation of their grip, then maybe you might be able to get the, the finger break. I actually prefer in this situation to like just make myself as low and big as possible. Um, and then the foot stomp. Foot stomps are awesome. I really wish people used foot stomps more. Um, they've recently, in the past like five or so years, I've started seeing them in uh, the UFC. So perhaps foot stomps are going to be coming in. They are not fighting ending techniques, but they are damaging techniques that if I can break your toes or collapse the arch of your foot, my God, I have done uh, wonders in giving myself a chance to get away from you. Um, and in this position, there's not a lot your opponent can do to defend their feet, um, especially if you've already secured their hands. So, um, but Overall, I think this technique would be real fucking hard for a smaller person to do to a bigger person. I think the headbutt's probably not going to hit. He didn't really sufficiently defend the grip. Um, it kind of looks like he just grabs it and pulls it away. Of course, he's on mute, so he may have more details that I'm missing. But he didn't sufficiently pull those grips away. Um, but the foot stomp is good. And of course, a solid uh, sidekick slash back kick. Um, is always a really potent tool to finish up a technique and give yourself some space. So I believe that is all five, right? Yeah. That concludes our look at these five self-defense moves everyone should know by Master Wong. Once again, Master Wong is one of the OGs of YouTube. His techniques have always been exciting for me to watch. He's kind of controversial and a lot of his stuff is questionable as we've talked about in this uh, particular video. But as we also saw, some of his shit's actually usable. Um, and for someone who has zero martial arts training, uh, I probably wouldn't go to Master Wong as my introduction to martial arts, but there is some fun little hidden gems that are mixed within there. And of course, I wish, I wish I had his kind of <laughs> absurd appeal and charisma. 
Of course, if you've made it to the end of this video and you haven't subscribed, you're clearly being entertained. So hit that subscribe button, click the bell and the thumbs up. You know how the whole YouTube thing is done. Some people will comment on these videos having not watched the whole video. So I want you to include the word absurd somewhere in your comments so you and I know you made it to the end before you started fiercely typing. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the video, that we have an online course now for you to train at at Kempo360.com where you can learn the 18 essential techniques for survival. Once again, that's at our website, Kenpo360.com. All the information to get signed up is in the description box down below. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.